What up, peeps? Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode number 174, recorded September 2021. I'm Drew Linsalata, creator and host of this, well, what I hope is a fine program. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for your support every week, your time, your attention. Speaking of support, by the way, very quick program note. The support for the podcast listener numbers are going through the roof the last couple of months. So I don't know what you guys are doing, but keep doing it. And thank you very much. So for those of you that come back every week and you listen and you're writing reviews and you're rating the podcast and the different platforms, I don't know what it is, but it's getting out of control in the best possible way. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you very, very much for the support. So that being said, this week, our topic is important. It's an important recovery topic. You may be thinking that you have no power in this process, right? It is out of your control, your anxiety, your trauma, your pain. These are monsters that are external to you. They stalk you, and you're just trying to find a way to keep them at bay. But in reality, you do have power in this process. So in this episode, I'm joined by my friend and frequent collaborator, Dr. Bridget Cooper. Dr. B is here again. She is expert in this topic and an excellent collaborator when it comes to this sort of thing. We are going to talk about gaining an awareness of the fact that you have choice in this process, you have power in this process, you have influence in this process, and you have responsibility in this process. And those are all really good things. You want that. So if you're feeling powerless over your anxiety, and you need to understand that you are not powerless, and you need to start to become aware of the choice that you have, the power, the influence you have, the responsibility you have, then this is the episode for you. It's a really good conversation about 20, 25 minutes, you guys are going to dig it. I know you will. I know you're going to dig Dr. B. You guys always seem to like when she's on the show. So let's get to it. At the end of the interview, I will come back and wrap it up. I will give you all Dr. B's links if you want to go and check her out, which you should because she's awesome. So here we go. And I will see you guys at the end as always. Dr. B. O-M-G. It's D-L. Drew. Oh. Drew Linslada. Wait. I don't even know if I'm worthy to be on this call now because how you are just like hovering over all other audio, Kindle books, whatever, everything (laughs) in the book genre is like bowing beneath you and your amazing, oh my God, I picked a number out of a hat, 7% slower. And now look at me just shine. Just saying. It was a crazy idea in like 2008 and here it is. So. The people listening are be like, wow, she's very flattering. And I'm thinking, she's being a little sarcastic, isn't she? Like, she's ribbing me. A like, little. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. A little bit. They don't know only that, but I, I know. <laughs> only because I know that Drew hates to be flattered. Oh, so that was I, all sport for me. Really difficult. And all torment for him. Yeah, I hope so, you enjoyed yeah. yourself. Yeah, that was really difficult. Um, yeah, you know. Anywho, the reason why I invited Dr. B to come on today is because today's podcast is about how responsibility equals power in the recovery process. And uh, as Dr. B is very fond of saying, God, you say it, it's your line. I mean, I think it sounds so good rolling off your lips, but I'm going to do it and then I'll just listen to you repeat it throughout the podcast because then, you know, I'll feel really flattered myself since I don't have the high ranking book uh, flex <laughs> that you've got. But anyway, uh, it's awareness equals choice and choice equals power. Very good. And it's, it is outstanding. That philosophy is really great. Now you've applied it in maybe slightly different areas like, uh, you know, dealing with pain and trauma recovery and that sort of stuff and just kind of general life transformation. I mean, that's really good advice for pretty much everybody in almost all Perhaps. aspects of life. Yeah, pretty much everybody because, you know, and it's a it's an easy train to understand because when you are aware of what you and other people are doing, what yeah. you and other people need, what is happening in the world, you can then have more choices as to how to respond or react or intervene engage in some way. Yeah. And that in, in and of itself gives you more personal power. So it's an easy train to, to see, to notice, and then to implement. I think where people begin to fall down on this is the first part. So for you, it's awareness, right? And, but, and so I was starting my premise with like responsibility equals power, taking responsibility for, yes. for the situation that you're in. Not to say that neither, and I'll speak for you on this one, I think I can, neither <laughs> Dr. B or I are implying that it's it's your fault, the situation that mm-hmm. you're in, right? So if you're in, in the grips of an anxiety disorder, that's not your fault in any way. So awareness of your of your role in it or taking responsibility for your role doesn't mean it was your fault. You didn't do something right. wrong, right? That's so, so, so important to say. But being aware of the fact that you do have a role. And you do have responsibility yeah. here. So you're, you're got the precursor, the awareness. That's a hard yes. sell for a lot of people, isn't it? You ever find resistance I guess, there? 
I guess so, because I think um, most of us are going through our lives unconscious to either parts or complete areas or the totality of ourselves, right? We're just, we're surviving every moment. And I know for the people that you work with, becoming aware is actually sometimes the enemy because you're hyper aware of everything that's happening, every breath, heartbeat, whatever it is, right? You're hyper aware. Yeah. So trying to tune into awareness for a lot of people is not just a tough sell, but it's a, it's a, it's a heavy lift. And knowing how to become aware and what to become aware of doesn't mean staying in awareness. And I think that's what a lot of people who are struggling with anxiety end up doing is they get stuck in the awareness step. Yeah. So they're sitting in this hyper vigilant awareness of every little thing in their and other people's surroundings, instead of moving into that choice Part, that responsibility part that you're talking about, which is moving from that, I can see I have a problem, I can see I'm panicked, I can see all these things, yeah. I know where it comes from, I've analyzed my life inside and out. Now, what do I do with it? Which is what so much of, of your stuff, your prescriptive things are about, are taking action on that awareness. I, I would say that it applies the same thing would, would hold true in the area that you usually work in, you know, where people mm -hmm. are dealing with trauma recovery and and pain and, and that sort of stuff and, and trying to overcome those things. Are you keenly aware of your past, keenly aware of the damage, keenly aware of the abuse, right? Keenly aware of all of those things. Right. So what are we trying to be aware of? It's oh, a different- So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna tee up a purchase of your book, like right here. Like, so everybody get onto Amazon right now and get 7% <laughs> slower because here it is, all right? The awareness that I preach and the awareness that you're preaching is actually about creating pauses between moments. It's about saying, it's about slowing your roll the hell down mm -hmm. so you can actually make a choice about the next thing you're going to entertain as a thought or the next behavior you're going to employ is actually slowing down enough to yeah. create that gap so that you can make a choice because most of the time we don't feel like we have a choice in how we're responding. I saw it, you know, in the stuff that you talk about, about you're like this, you know, this lizard brain, right. Yeah. And running, running, running. We're all stuck in those same kind of grooves until we're not. Yes. So in order to get that choice, we have to create a gap between the awareness of what we've been thinking about and where we're going to find the choice as to what we're going to take responsibility over to do differently next time or so in this moment. The awareness in next that, time different. Right. So the awareness in that situation is an awareness that I can do that. Yes. So, yeah. And uh, many yes. people will say, and I'm sure many people in your sphere too, like they're just so <laughs> racked with, with guilt or resentment or anger or pain or vulnerability or whatever it happens to be. Now, my crowd might be a little bit different. They're racked with their symptoms and the intrusive thoughts and all of those things. But you can actually put a pause between the thought or the emotion and the action that comes after that. And Correct. that's where the awareness comes in. I can put in a pause and then I can decide what to do next as opposed to automatically saying, my lizard brain made me do this or the narcissist in my life that had me for 10 years is making me do this. Same thing. Correct. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's taking that responsibility and saying my, how I got here might not be my fault, but how I get out, I get to take power over that. I get to be responsible for that. Yeah. And that's that shift. You know, I get a lot of people who are very, uh, you know, when we're talking about trauma recovery or just, even if it's not what they're thinking of as trauma, but bad relationships, a bad boss, you know, crappy coworkers, whatever it is. They're coming to me and they want to tell me the story over and over and over again about why they got here because they're looking for validation. Yeah. After I've fed that validation monster enough, that's time to say, okay, yeah, I get it. I get how you got here. I get all the terrible people and, and circumstances and issues that have brought you to this moment, but they aren't going to bring you out and they aren't holding you here. The only person holding you here and the only person, therefore, who can get you out is you. Yeah. And I, I think that's where your responsibility piece comes in and where my choice piece comes in because it both it leads to that power and putting you back in power. Because for so many of your people too, yeah. who have been through trauma, who have or are in it right now, right? Yeah. Or in bad circumstances, relationships are in the trauma of anxiety and the grips of it itself. Mm -hmm. 
it feels scary to think that they actually have power because they feel like something else has been in power all this time. Yeah. Or so. if something else put me here, be it whatever element of there may be abusive or traumatic past or the anxiety, which people will talk about like it's its own sentient monster that's stalking them, <laughs> which I get. I totally get that. Yeah, um, it feels you know, like it. Right. So it feels like, well, all this stuff put me here and it's completely out of my control. So therefore, yeah. I cannot possibly have any control with getting out of it. I have to hope that it somehow Excellent. changes or somehow my past goes away or somehow fades or something. So I get that. And, you know, one of the more interesting and powerful statements I've ever heard, and I want to say it was a Claire Week statement, and I've had people repeat it back to me over and over was the statement that says, well, the how I got here isn't wasn't necessarily my fault. But the, the one thing that is keeping me stuck here is me. Yeah, yeah, which is a really I mean, look, out of context, if somebody just like took that clip, they would probably like come after us with picture works and torches, because it sounds like victim blaming in some way, shape or form. But it's really not. It's, you know, the only thing keeping it's me actually sick is me. the most heroic thing you can say, because it actually to yourself. puts the power yeah. Yes. Because it actually puts the power back with you. Yes. Because if if the anxiety as that monster chasing you down or your trauma history monster chasing you down, that gives that experience or that condition mm -hmm. the power over everything past, present, and future. Right. That's that's troubling. Right. Because then that that's actually just it, it means that you're never going to get out of the, the way of this oncoming train because it just keeps coming. Yes. Whereas if you say something brought you here, but you get to bring yourself out, then all of a sudden you're in charge of something. Yeah. Like you get to change that. And that's such a it sounds like, you know, oh, maybe there's fear that somebody's going to come after me, the pitchfork for saying that. But to me. I, that's the most beautiful statement someone could make to me because it says it doesn't matter anymore what happened back there. I mean, it matters in the sense of I want to validate you and your experience and your trauma, but it isn't here anymore. The only person holding it here yeah. is me or is you, Yes, right? Like I, I get to make the decision. You get to make the decision to say no more. And you know, I have colorful language, so I won't use it here, but I'll, I'll abbreviate you know, when people have asked me, you know, how did you get out of the way of all of the things that happened to you? Like, you know, your father doing this to your mom, whatever, all these people. And, you know, how did you not let that become the narrative of the rest of your life? And I said, F that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In all its vernacular, in all of its power, because why would I, to allow that to continue is to hand my life over to someone or something that doesn't have the grace or the responsibility or the, um, the love to hold that. Yeah. Like I don't give that to them. So I think there's, there's, I hope with your population, I know with the powerful way that you speak to them, it's an act of rebellion yes. to take back your power and to move forward. We talked about that. So every Friday I do the recovery room on Instagram with some of my friends and collaborators. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, that while in some of the ways that I talk about, you know, becoming non-reactive toward anxiety and panic may look very passive. For me personally, that was a tremendous act of defiance. It still oh, is. Yeah. So, you know, it might look like I'm just limp in a chair, letting myself panic, but it is the opposite of being, I like to use the term being dragged. So I'll say all the yes. time, like, well, do you want to continue to let this thing drag you up and down the block where you have no choice and you are just being dragged? Or do you want to recognize that, oh, I can do something different? And something different might be literally to say, I have a choice to allow the panic to come. I, the analog, I have a choice to allow that memory to come in your world. Right. 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 And, and I will let it come and get me and I will do my best to process it rather than letting it grab me and drag me and do whatever it wants with me. I get to participate in this process actively. Now, it doesn't mean that you have the ultimate positive outcome the first time you decide to do that. It's a work in progress and it changes. Right. I mean, the ultimate positive Wouldn't it be great? outcome the like, first time? Like what? I mean, this well, isn't like Instagram, Drew. This is thank like- Thank you. It's life, <laughs> right? Mean, you but might think, put this on Instagram, but this is not like a Snapchat filter. Yeah, like but life I, is hard. There's there's some ugly, grueling, messy moments. And yes. if you try to 
sell people on. It's, you know, it's one of those 4 a.m. infomercials where all of a sudden all their cellulite is going to go, their wrinkles are going to disappear and, you know, whatever, you know, get a million dollars in their bank account by tomorrow yeah. morning at seven. Yeah, it's not going to happen. It's, it's, it's the only way out is through. You Hell know, yeah. you got to go through those tough moments in order to get to the place where it's not always difficult. It's funny. I know a guy that has a podcast that made shirts that say the only way out is through. In Latin. The only way out is through. Yeah, but he said yeah. in Latin. He's a really cool dude. Anyway. Um, oh, yeah. wow. I think <laughs> just, that was a saying. shameless plug, Drew. And I <laughs> feel never, like. I never um, talked about the Wow. Ever. So my flattering you on the front <laughs> is now you think now you me have just like, I'm just open plug license now, to just right. be like, hey, guess what? Go hey, to my website and go pick my only way out is through shirts up for, you know. <laughs> the I don't even know my damn website. Whatever. I'm the worst. But anyway, I, I think. It's important to recognize that. And what, what Dr. B is saying is, is right. It's messy. It's nasty. It's ugly. It's muddy. It's dirty. It's dusty. It's all of those things. It's up. It's down. You get knocked on your rear end. You got to get back up again. All of those things. This is not the final scene of a Drew Barrymore movie where they all, you know, they get out the tears and then they're dancing in the kitchen and that's the end scene. Like, it doesn't happen that yeah. way. So I think that's where a lot of people get put back a little bit, like, or they get disappointed. They have the epiphany that like, Ooh, I'm, I'm the only one in an anxiety disorder. Like, wow, I have an active role in my own recovery here. I can make choices. I can participate. I have power. Okay. I'm all good. Cause now I know that. No, not really. No, like, now you got to yeah. do it. And it's, it's really, really difficult work, but the awareness that first, the awareness to go back to it, that you have a choice and you have agency in that, and you can exert some influence leads to, you know, awareness equals choice. You can choose to do things differently and choice is power. So for me, it's responsibility yeah. equals power. And it does. It does. And so it does. Yeah. But it, you know that in order for them, how we blend this is that in order for them, anybody to take responsibility, they have to become aware yes. of the responsibility itself, right? And have. of the tools that you offer that others have offered in their recovery to be able to go on that recovery journey. Right. So right. there's a there's an awareness of those resources and awareness of their agency in it in order to take it and actually do anything with it. And it's so funny. It's okay. You can shorten it. It's fine. You can take your role of responsibility equals power and just know that it came from me and awareness equals choice and, and choice totally equals fine. power. It's fine. There'll always totally be an fine. asterisk stolen unabashedly from Bridget Cooper. Yeah, it's totally fine. fine. But Go I think, it. you know, it, it's so funny because the, and it, it does, what I find interesting is when you embrace this, you know, mm -hmm. awareness, responsibility, choice, power, blah, blah, blah. it still looks the same. Like yeah. on the path that you take and the action, you know, the situation does not change. It looks exactly the same. So a lot of people, I think they get a little freaked out by that, but like, okay, great. I have power. I have responsibility. I'm going to be responsible for my own recovery. And they think somehow it means it will look differently. It doesn't. No. Uh, my experience is that you just experience it and process it differently. You begin to learn from the right. suffering as opposed to being dragged down and just perpetuating the suffering. Correct. Yeah. The, the events are the same, but your relationship to the events changes and that's everything. Yes. So, you know, going, going to a crazy house, um, you know, I, when I ask people, I'm like, Hey, so, um, tell me the most stressful thing you can do in any given year. And they're like, go home for the holidays, you know, like walk back into the, you know, the, the, hellstorm that is their, you know, their family, you know, of origin. And yet we go back, right? We go, we go and we do this thing. The difference in recovery of becoming aware and becoming aware of our choices and taking responsibility for our part in any of that dance or dynamic yeah. is to be able to enter that same space, that same crazy environment, you know, mashed potatoes being flung willy nilly, you know, whatever that is, you know, crazy uncle, you know, throwing back a few too many, you know, all of those things is being able to be in that environment and not relate to it in the same way that you did before, not being hysterical or yelling or crying or hiding, but being aware and being able to make different choices about how you interact in that same environment. So that's just how change looks is that once you have different tools, once you have more awareness, once you recognize your power, you can be in the same um, hectic, chaotic environment that you were in before and have an entirely different experience of it. Yeah. It's really very internalized because it then becomes like you yes. said, how you experience it, how you process it, how you relate to it. It makes all the difference. 
And right. there, there's a certain amount of there's passive versus active there. Like now I'm an yeah. active participant in this crazy house of Thanksgiving in my dysfunctional family, or I'm now an active participant in this panic attack or in these intrusive thoughts or in, in these scary thoughts that plague me all day long. I'm now actively participating in this, choosing how I will relate to them. How will I respond to them? How will I interact with them? Right. Very different. And I think, yeah, very different. Yeah. And I think, I think in, in that recovery process, it's important to notice notice the difference, you know? So when you're doing these things and you're all of a sudden taking responsibility and you're taking an active role in your, in your anxiety recovery, you're doing these things differently is to notice, wow, this does feel different than it felt before. I may not be better yet. Right. I may not not be having this panic attack. I may not, you know, I, I may not be where I want to be eventually, but I'm actually feeling differently in this moment than yeah. I felt in similar moments before. And simply noticing that is a way of being able to record progress and build on that progress. Yeah, because we... that that noticing is really important. What I notice with a lot of people that I work with, and and, and we have a lot of crossover, yeah. a lot of people who have, you know, anxiety disorders. And what they often will do is if I'm not a hundred percent there, I'm not there at all. You yes. know, that cognitive yeah. distortion yeah, of all or nothing all thinking. Or so, yeah. yeah. So it's about when you notice that you've made progress, that this does look different to challenge that cognitive distortion of because I'm not all the way there, I haven't even begun the journey. Noticing where you are along the points of the journey allows you to recognize progress, not perfection yet. It, yeah, progress, not perfection is a big catchphrase. And it's, but it should be because it's, it's valid. We, in my community, we tend to talk about not so much that you will start to feel different. The feel different comes later. The feel different for my people, it's a, it's a happy side effect, if you will. But mm. which you start to learn and you have to, two podcast episodes ago, I said, are you refusing to learn the lessons of recovery when it hands them to you? So when you go into that same chaotic Thanksgiving dinner that you really don't want to go to with your dysfunctional family, or you turn and confront and allow your intrusive thoughts or allow all your anxiety symptoms or your panic, you, you, there are lessons to be had when you engage actively now and use your power, but you have mm -hmm. to be willing to, in, to take those lessons. And that is, oh, I did something. I made a choice. I acted differently. And look, it didn't take me down. I've always right. been afraid I'm that it would here. take me down. I'm still here. I still, what can I learn from what just happened here? What can I learn from this last trip home with crazy drunk uncle? So, mm -hmm. but if you're not, it's, it's important to understand the awareness and make your choice and take your responsibility and then exercise your power. But then you have to take the lesson that that, ex, that new experience gives you. Because if you just yes. repeat, like, it was terrible, it was horrible, I felt awful, it was terrifying, my heart was pounding, I was short of breath, I thought I was going to pass out, I kept thinking I wanted to kill my dog. Or these people are horrible. My family is full of raging narcissists. They're so abusive. This is terrible that you didn't learn the lesson. So you're wasting no. your power, I think. Right. Because you didn't collect that lesson and, and have it inform a future behavior experience. So yeah. in, in surviving a, a panic moment, right, being able to know that you didn't die or you didn't kill your dog or you didn't do those things, it's to come to the end of that moment and say, OK, so what did I see? What did I notice? What is true now? What was true then yes. that I didn't think was true before? You know, so I, I had all these assumptions. I was, and I talk a lot about narrating. Mm -hmm. So one of the most powerful tools is how we tell the story. So you and I could go to the exact same event, have, you know, the exact same dinner, have the same service, has, have everything. And we could leave and you and I could go independent of one another to a, to a mutual friend and mm -hmm. tell them about our experience. And they would think we were not even together in the same room. Right. Which is very right. Exactly. That's so important. It happens all the time. Telling the story, so forget 7% slower, in The Anxious Truth, that, that book, which if you listen to the podcast, you should own, chapter three, change your reaction <laughs> after, is the storytelling. So, you know, for yes. us, it's always change the reaction before, that's how you deal with anticipatory anxiety, the reaction during, how you interacting while you're in the midst of the exposure or the panic, and after, the reaction after is the storytelling. So, yes. you know, narration is a big deal. I always try and tell people, stop narrating the fear and start narrating the lesson and the win. Not yes. because you'll magically have this brand new mindset and everything will be hunky dory, but you have to narrate the reality of it and accept the reality. This was really uncomfortable. I hate being around those people or I hate having panic attacks. But again, it didn't hurt. It didn't kill me. It didn't take me down. 
right. that's the narration. And it's very and it's very hard to to believe something different or experience something differently if you keep telling the same story you have always told that landed you in that place to begin with. Exactly. And you and I have had this conversation that we would rather be right than be happy. Yeah, okay. And so we yeah. we seek consistency. Yeah. So it's okay. So I, I have such compassion for your listeners and your readers that are in mine that are stuck in a story because it feels safe to at least know what's coming, at least know what, you know, what, what the end point is going to be, but it keeps being the end point because you keep telling the story the same way. If you shifted some part of your story, if you noticed something different about your story this time, everything else could change because you would be right about this new observation. So you could continue to be right and be happy in a new way versus holding the same old story and being right because you just keep telling the story consistently yes. and not be happy at all. That's interesting. I'd rather be right than happy does apply in a lot of instances because giving up the narration of that was terrible, that was terrible, that was terrible. When you tell people give up that narration and instead recognize the reality that you're still standing, sometimes it feels invalidating to them, I think. Yeah. No, 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 I'm not trying to invalidate your experience, but you, as part of the new narration is acknowledging and validating the experience. That really sucked. Yeah. That was really hard. That was really scary. That was really uncomfortable, but I did it. So, okay, but I, and I want to, I want to uh, change the word, but I did it and I did it. And uh, there you go. That's even and better. I think one and of the I things, did it. I think one of the things that we tend to, to discount is the ability to hold two realities that seem to be in opposition. Are we, we, why are we right? not doing these on a regular basis? More than one thing can be true at the know. same time. I don't even know. But 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 the point of it is that in order to hold that um, that forward momentum, mm-hmm. we have to and be able to tell that story in your step three that that tell that story this in a different way is not to invalidate the initial experience. It's to add color, flavor, layer, and complexity to the original story, which is I can feel completely out of control, uh, you know, under fire, freaked out, scared, and powerful. At the same time. I can have both of those things at the same time. Yes. I can hold both truths. And so many of us are under this illusion that we can only hold one or the other. And in that, in, in doing so, we negate half of our experience. Yeah. One of the, the statements, the very simple statements that kind of started my ball rolling years ago was, you can be afraid and safe at the same time. It was one yes. of the original, probably one of my earliest posts on social media was that. And it was, wait, what? Wait, what? Like, how can that be? Afraid means unsafe, right? Well, sometimes it does, but oftentimes it doesn't. Just as one yes. example of two things that can be true at the same time. So there you go. There it is. All right. There so, so there you go. So become aware of, the, of you know, the situation. Different awareness. Not awareness of how horrible it is, but awareness of the fact that you have agency. And then, yes. then make different choices. And then you become responsible for those choices. And then you have power. And then you can start to make change. So, yes. And yes. you can live a better, more abundant life because that's all that Drew and I want for you. Yeah. In the end, it does. It might be slow and it might be incremental and it might be painfully like you might be really frustrated sometimes, but it does lead to good places. So accept your responsibility for your ability to change your situation because you have it no matter what anybody tells you. You do. You absolutely do. Yeah. Bravo. Good job, Dr. B. Thank you for coming as always. If people right were going to read one of your books to start, which one do you think they should read? For my population, I mean, you know, Little Landslides and Pain Rebel, neck and neck. Yeah, Little Landslides and Pain Rebel are kind of like a duo. Little Landslides, if you have a stomach or a hunger for reading, um, you know, narrative, because uh, it's a, it's my life story. So if you like biography, autobiography stuff, that's a, it's, it's a, it's a sucker punch, you know, right to the throat. It's but it's, it's a good, it's a good story, and I think it demonstrates that you can see some pretty dark and and windy uh, places and yeah. still emerge light and strong. And then Pain Rebel is really more instructive about being able to, because I think a lot of your listeners they have two kind of things going on some, uh, simultaneously, which is they have anxiety disorder, which is like this present right in their face problem, yeah. but then all of the stuff that's underneath that and got them to that place or is reinforcing that place or preventing them from going any place with it Mm -hmm. is some of their, their pain history. And so pain rebel is that accompaniment that helps you 
manage and, and challenge that in very practical, tactical ways to be able to alleviate some of those symptoms that I think when working in pair with, with some of the things you're doing is a, is a beautiful recovery story. One day we should probably take 15 minutes and bundle those two books together. So I would tell you, yeah. and look, you know, come to my website. This is episode 174, I believe. So if you go to the slash 174, I'll have all Dr. B's links over there. It, when you read Pain Rebel after you read Little Landslides, it makes, because I read Little Landslides first, and Pain yeah. Rebel, it comes from such a position of authority. I'm like, whoa, this person actually walked this walk. They didn't are just writing the theory of how to handle pain and overcome it. They, they did it. But the combination of, I think, Pain Rebel and The Anxious Truth are perfect companion books. We should bundle them somehow. We'll figure that out. Heck yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. Anyway, yeah. thanks for coming, B. It's always good. Thanks. We have thanks, to be good Drew. more often. All right, guys, go visit Dr. B. Go to my uh, website, theanxioustruth.com slash 174 and go to Dr. B's links and follow her and tell her I said hi. Peace out. Peace out. All righty then. We are back in the studio and that just means standing at the exact same desk that I was at yesterday when I was talking to Dr. B. So do not be fooled by my ridiculousness. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. I certainly enjoyed having the conversation. Dr. B and I have so much overlap. We really do overlap a lot in the things that we write about and the things that we say. So you guys should totally check her out. If you go to my website, uh, the show notes for this episode are at theanxioustruth.com slash 174. I will have the full show notes for this episode. I will have links to Dr. B's website and Facebook and Instagram and, and her books, uh, Little Landslides and Pain Rebel, if you guys want to check her, check that out. I urge you to at least follow her on social media because she's just a kind soul and a good helper. So there you go. That wraps up episode number 174. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming back as always. I will leave you with Afterglow by my friend and an amazing musician, Ben Drake, also a guy with a heart of gold, by the way. So if you like Afterglow, you like hearing it all the time in all these podcast episodes, go check out Ben at bendrakemusic.com. And if you are listening to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or someplace that lets you rate and review it, leave us a five-star rating if you dig it, and then take another minute, maybe write a little paragraph of a review. Because when you do that, it helps other people find the podcast that may benefit from it. And really, that's why I do all of this stuff, try and help as many people as I can. All right, guys, thanks for coming by for this episode. I will see you next week. Thank you for your support, as always. Go check out 7% Slower, by the way. That book is getting rave reviews. 7%slower.com. All right, that's my plug for the week. I will see you guys next week. Remember, this is the way. It's in the lyrics of the songs we know. It's in these feelings that you never show. Yeah, y'all doing fine. It's all around you. you can Your story begins You got the feeling that you're gonna win